open carriage enters the ancient city of London at Temple Bar. It's perhaps the moment to remember the love Sir Winston had for this great capital. It was a bond and shattered place when he spoke these words in 1941 in tribute to its courageous people. My heart bled for London and Londoners. The courage, the unconquerable grit and stamina of the Londoners showed itself from the very outset. If a storm is to be renewed, London will be ready. London will not flinch. London can take it again. Here now on the steps of St. Paul's, the Queen has arrived. of the Queen. He carries the sword himself. Now all the guests are in their places. And in ten minutes time, the gun crew and the gun carriage will themselves arrive in the St. Paul's forecourt for the beginning of the service. Here, walking now out of St. Paul's, twelve of Sir Winston's oldest friends and colleagues, the pallbearers, about to go down the steps into the forecourt to take up their position, ready for the arrival of the gun carriage and its crew. Earl Alexander, who will be joined by Earl Mountbatten when Earl Mountbatten arrives with the procession. Lord Avon, and the graceful gesture of the frail and now elderly Earl Attlee, Sir Winston's wartime colleague and peacetime opponent, come to pay his respects. Field Marshal Lord Slim, Lord Bridges, Lord Norman Brook, Field Marshal Sir Gerald Templer, and Mr. Harold Macmillan and Sir Robert Menzies, the Prime Minister of Australia. Here from the top of St. Paul's Dome, we see in Ludgate Hill, the procession slowly nearing the steps of St. Paul's itself.
lady Churchill. With the most solemn moment in today's great ceremony now upon us, as Sir Winston's body enters the cathedral, which only pays this honor to Britain's greatest men, should we not recall his own words, which provide the very essence of the attitudes he upheld so magnificently in life? The only guide to a man is his conscience. The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. It is very imprudent to walk through life without this shield, because we are so often mocked by the failure of our hopes. But with this shield, however the fates may play, we march always in the ranks of honor. Winston's honorary American citizenship, the great hymn, the battle hymn of the Republic, last sung here in this place at the memorial ceremony for President Kennedy.
the Royal Marine Guard of Honor, uh, the 41st, 43rd Commander. moment, as the nation's public homage nears its end, Sir Winston's body is about to be confided to the care of his family. Here are the words he spoke of the many who died during the war, whose company he now joins. Only faith in a life after death in a brighter world, where dear ones will meet again. Only that, and the measured tramp of time, can give consolation. salute. London's doctors are lowering their cranes. Shortly there'll be a 19-gun salute from the gunners at the tower, the most ever accorded for a commoner then as the launches head out into the river to join their escorts, the Trinity House launch Noor, two police launches, there will be an RAF fly past of 16 lightnings from Wattisham in salute. say to the House, as I said to those who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all our might, with all the strength that God can give us, 
to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory there is no survival. Let that be realized. No survival for the British Empire. No survival for all that the British Empire stood for. No survival for the urge and impulse of the ages that mankind will move forward towards its goal. But I take up my task with buoyancy and hope. I feel sure that our cause will not be suffered to fail among men. At this time, I feel entitled to claim the aid of all. And I say, come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the seas and oceans, we shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. So we come to Waterloo Station. Very soon now. The train will pull out, drawn by a Battle of Britain class engine. Its name, Winston Churchill. The railwaymen here call this platform the Laughing and Crying Platform because it is the platform at which all the main trains and the boat trains and the great arrivals and departures you. They can never have seen a day like this. who have been waiting quietly go into their four Pullman coaches. One more will carry the bearer party. So the doors are now closed and the carriage carrying the coffin. And all is ready.
So Britain's capital in the great world say farewell to Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, Knight of the Garter, Order of Merit, and Companion of Honor. Now that great voice is stilled. The incomparable services he rendered his country under six reigns for seven decades become part of the history he wrote. Now he will lie in a little leafy Oxfordshire churchyard next to his mother, his father, his brother, and his family. Not far away there stands, in the park of Blenheim Palace, the home of his great ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, the column of victory erected in memory of his great forebear. The inscription at the base rings across nearly 250 years of surely unequaled endeavor by two members of the same family, as true of the one as of the other. When exerted the most, rescued the empire from desolation, asserted and confirmed the liberties of Europe. What General Vagon has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the light of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty. So bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour.